Yeah, but they had the flu, and I think it was dormant in me until I went to New York City last weekend for the wrestling tournament, and uh, I came back, and wow. So, feel free to pray for me here. Um, <laughs> here's, let, me, let me throw something out to you. Some of you would know this about me, and some of you, some of you don't. Here's something I believe. I believe that the Bible actually is God's Word, that what the Bible says, God says. Now, that, that's something you'll need to think about, come to grips with, you know, one, make a decision about. But let's just say that that's true. Like, just say that you agree with me on that, that the Bible is God's Word. So if the Bible is God's Word, then how would you fill in this blank? If the Bible is God's Word, then the Bible is blank. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to give you one minute. See how fast everybody can get one sheet. Ready? Go. Oh. You gotta go fast. Oh, Somebody move All right, so how'd you answer that? If the Bible is God's word, then the Bible is? True. Okay, true is probably the first one that comes to people's mind. I would say you could also get it's important, it's um, whatever, but true, okay? So here's, here's a question for you then. If the Bible is true, what happens when you find a contradiction? What are you going to do with that? You know, and here's, here's what I think sometimes people do. They see something that looks like a contradiction, but it's just like, well, okay, I just don't get it. So you ignore it. Then you keep reading it. You come to another one. Ah, you know, that just, I don't really get it. You know? So you ignore it and you ignore it. And you know how it is. It's like uh, the illustration I'll use for this would be like, um, Actually, I use this illustration. I, I was talking to some of your coaches this morning. We had a really fun time in Bible study. Uh, we meet in the baseball building, so there were three of the baseball coaches, like some of the wrestling coaches, um, yeah, basketball, gymnastics. Anyway, good, good group of guys. But I gave this illustration. Nathan Tomasello and Kyle Snyder are roommates. All right. And there's another guy that lives in their apartment that's not a wrestler. Now that, I don't know, that would, that would feel a little intimidating to me. Like I like those guys, I know they won't pick on me. But let's just say, let's say, I don't even know the other guy's name. Let's say his name is Steve. And let's say Steve tends to leave his dishes out and that bothers Nathan. But you know, Nathan being like not a complainer, he kind of ignores him. You know, he picks up after Steve. Kyle doesn't like when he leaves his food out or his milk out, but he ignores it, he just puts the milk away. And so you do that, and you do that, and you do, they've been living together for, let's say, four months now, and then all of a sudden, you know, either Nathan or Kyle, they're kind of in a bad mood. And Steve leaves his milk out, and all of a sudden, Nathan throws him down the steps, <laughs> throws a headlock on him, you know, rips his ear off, and poor Steve is like, all I did was leave the milk out, okay? Well, why did he react like that? I'm not saying he would, but why did he react like that? You let it build up. See, and so all of a sudden then you, you, you ignore things that seem like they might be contradictions, and then all of a sudden you're just like, <clears throat> I think this whole thing isn't true. I'm gonna scrap it, or whatever. Because I think we have one that looks like a pretty apparent contradiction here. So let's, let's get a reader, since my voice is kind of Worn out. Somebody, I need you to read nice and loud since you're in the back and everybody will hear you coming up. Read the first one starting there in Matthew 27. Read the whole, the whole section there? The whole thing. Okay. The whole first paragraph. Yeah. yeah. And when they, when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them cast, by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charges against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then the two robbers were crucified with him, 
one on the right and one on the left, and those who passed by derided him, uh, waging their heads, or wagging their heads, and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests, with the scribes and elders, mocked him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he desires him. For he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Okay, so you heard that. You got that. You got this story about the crucifixion. I remember I was doing a program years ago in uh, Taylor Hall, Taylor Dorm. You know, and it was just you were entertaining questions and an giving answers or thoughts about spirituality, about Christianity. And somebody threw this out. They go, you know, look at the Bible can't even get the main event right. They can't even get to the crucifixion and agree amongst the authors. It, it is interesting, even when he was just reading this. Notice what they said there. I mean, this, is, this isn't relevant to what I'm going to talk about. But notice what he says. He says, let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Right? Now, it, it's, that's an interesting one, because then they waited a little while longer, and then he was dead, and then they put him in the tomb, and then he came up from the tomb, or he came out from that. I would say that's a bigger one. That's a bigger one. And a lot of people did believe. A lot of people did believe. Okay, so you, you heard that. Who wants to read the next one? Nice and loud. I got it. Jerry, Mike. I, I Jake's got it. Oh, oh okay. Go <laughs> Two others, who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the Skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But they, and they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by, watching. But the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged, ra hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Okay, now you can look at the two accounts. You could say, well, like the one says, Jesus prayed for them, right? Father, forgive them. And the other passage doesn't say that. Is that a contradiction? No. No, that's, that's not a contradiction. It's just a fuller account. But there is a pretty clear contradiction in here. So get in groups of three or four, five. I don't really care. I'm not going to tell you how many people to get in the group. And come up with what is the contradiction and what's the solution? What's the contradiction and what's the solution? And I'm going to play the role of the person that, yeah, I'm not really sure of this. I think you Christians are wrong. And I want to come, I want you to come up with a good answer. I'm going to give you a hard time back, you know. I did that with the coaches today, and Coach Ryan came up with kind of a silly answer. I was just giving him a hard time. It was, it was kind of fun. Okay, go ahead. What's the contradiction? Come up with a solution. Right? There was a business, there was a business, and it was like, the whole business. 
Okay, I'm going to cut in. What's the contradiction? Nathan. Contradiction. You got, did anybody find another contradiction? Somebody this morning said, in the one it's in bold print and the other it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I Tom was kidding. That's why I was giving him a hard time. Okay, so that's the contradiction. So what's the solution? So you got two more minutes and you don't know who I'm going to call on to give this answer. <laughs> Somebody, you know, there, nobody's going to make eye contact. So, so. I know. Mike! <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? What's the solution to that? I'm the skeptic. This is like on the, on the football team three years ago, Michael Bennett, man, he had all these questions. It was great, over and over. So I'm Michael Bennett. Come on, Mike. You gotta read What's all, the answer? You got to read all four uh, Gospels. You got to read all four. What does that mean? Synopsis. Okay. But I still, even if I just read two, I found that they can't even agree. So if I add four, what's, what, what, how much worse is it going to get? Right. Uh, what's the solution? MC. We said that um, it's all a matter of perspective. Perhaps Matthew was standing in the back and could just hear the, or see the robbers talking and they looked like they were reviling him. So we could say that they were, like he lumped them together. I mean, so Matthew is writing, inspired by God, he's writing God's word and he's misinterpreting what these guys are saying. For real? Yeah. Hmm? I'm being mean. No. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you see this is a question, okay. If, you know, uh, many years ago, before I came to faith, if you gave me that answer, I'm like, yeah, you know, people are right. Christians are stupid. <laughs> you know, that's probably what I would have thought. So keep going, keep going. Give me, a, come up with one. Back here, you guys got a good, got a thought? All right. Miles Martin, national champion, just won. Yeah! Kyle Snyder, national champion, just won. You guys got a sheet? Yeah. Okay, all right. All right, yeah, I think great answer. Did you guys catch that, what he was saying? No. Okay, say it again, nice and loud. Uh, first impression is that at one time, both of the thieves were reviling him, but then later on, Change yeah, here's the thing. So, something to think about. Here's, here's part of the solution. Crucifixion, the way the Romans did it, was not like an electric chair. It wasn't like a hanging. It wasn't like a firing squad. It, it wasn't over like that. In fact, in, in, in historical accounts, some people survived for well over a day in crucifixion. So basically, crucifixion was, was a method of capital punishment that you were being tortured to death. In fact, we get later in the accounts in the Gospels, 
they wanted these guys to be dead before the Passover began. So what did they do? Anybody remember that story? What do they do to the other guys? Break their leg. They break their legs so they can't keep pushing up and getting air. And so then they suffocate. The heart blows up and they die. All right, so it's, it's so crucifixion is a period of time. So some people would look and say, well, if you look at the account, Jesus only lasted for six hours. Some people lasted for over a day. What was Jesus kind of a whim? I mean, why did Jesus die so fast? Any thoughts on that one? No, that was at the end to prove he was dead. The scourging? The, spear, the okay. scourging? Like when they scourged him? Yeah, and, they had scourged know. him, they had beaten him. And if you get a picture of what happened to Jesus in the scourging, I mean, you don't, you don't want the picture. You don't want that in your mind. I mean, he was beaten so badly that, that even in, in historical accounts under the Roman scourge, that many, many, if not the majority of those who were scourged died from the scourge. They didn't even need to be crucified. Jesus walks this whole way. If you, if you, you look at medical people have looked at this, because this is one of the most famous deaths in history, right? And, you know, and I would argue the most important. Okay, funny story. Well, not funny. But I remember when I was beginning to look at Christianity, and then I, I came to faith right after I got out of high school. I, I looked, I said, you know, as I look at this and as I read things, I think Jesus really is who he claimed to be. I think he really did die for my sins. And I came to faith, and then we get around Easter, you know, and I grew up, I, I had gone to church, and so I had heard some of these things, but I never really thought about them. And I go, okay, so what, wait, we got Easter coming up, and then Friday, I, they, they call it Good Friday. And I'm like, Good Friday, what happened on Good Friday? Well, Jesus got crucified. <laughs> I'm kind of like, what kind of a sick religion is this? <laughs> you know, oh, this is really neat, you know, but why, why is it good? What's so good about it? You know, he went to the cross to take away your sin, to give you the only way that you can have forgiveness and eternal life. It is, it's Good Friday. I, got, I just got off track, so where was I? I don't know. Okay, he's beaten so bad. You know, so he's... he's Jesus is well along the way physically to dying by the time they hang him on the cross. So he's on the cross, and just like he said here, this guy's looking, and if you think about it, here's what I think we have. Sometimes we look and we see something that appears to be a contradiction, but the more we begin to look at it, and this is true in other areas of Scripture, the more we look at it, the more the truth really comes out about what's going on. And I think what we have here is actually what I would say is probably the clearest picture. Okay, I'll say one of the clearest pictures of conversion, of coming to faith, to saving faith in Christ that we have in all of Scripture. And, and so I want to look at the pattern here that happens. Notice <clears throat> the guy's up there, and they're both making fun of Jesus. And then he begins to notice things. One of the things, Jesus is forgiving those who are crucified. You know, you might be looking, it's like, wow, Jesus is responding really well to these people. And he's doing, you know, and he's, he's not reacting. He's not, he's not angry. He's not whining. He's not whatever. And then, and, then it, and then the storm comes in, and the sky gets dark, and this whole thing. It's like, I mean, if you're hanging on that cross, it's got to be making you think. Wouldn't you, you know, you can't run away. It, the, the account tells us most of the people went back into the city. He's stuck there. He can't get away from this. All right? And so look at the, look at the flow here. Uh, we have it. Look what this guy says. And I, and I think what we have here is a great picture, like I said, of the process of summing, someone coming to true faith. So look what he says. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him. We're down in the, towards the end, verse 39. Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Okay, so what's the point? This guy is thinking. Why do you think he's thinking about it so much? I mean, what would make him think about this so much? What's that? You got to go louder. He's about to die. Yeah, he, he's going to die. You know, I mean, death is imminent. And the truth is, you know, in the in the long scope of years in history, death is imminent for every one of us and every person you know. We don't know how imminent, you know, 
might be 50 years, might be five years, might be a year. For this guy, he knows it's in the hours. All right. And so he's thinking, he says, don't you fear God. So look at the first step. And I think this is a key first step. I would say this. If you, if, let's say you're here tonight and you've never really thought about this. If you don't have any kind of a fear or reverence of God, and that's the first thing if you want to fill in those little blanks at the bottom. Uh, stages of salvation. Fear or reverence for God. If you don't come to the point that you have a reverence for God, I don't think you're going to get beyond that. I don't think you're going to take a serious look at Jesus. Does that make sense? You know, you know, if you don't have that fear and reverence, you're not going to go to the next step. So that would be the first thing. Second thing that happened, he says, do you not fear God? You're under the same condemnation. Now listen what he says. I want you to think about it. This guy's hanging on the cross. He's being crucified. Look what he says. And we indeed justly for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Okay, I want you to try to think about that. What have you done that if you were being crucified, you'd say, man, I absolutely deserve this? You, you catch what he's saying here? This guy's saying, I deserve to be crucified. So what would you say about this guy? What, what, what observation would you make about his um, understanding as it, as it pertains to coming to faith in Christ? He knows he's a sinner. So, he knows he's a sinner. Yeah, he, yeah. he knows he's done wrong. He, he knows he's a sinner. And, you know, the issue is, if, if we look, I, I think sometimes uh, one of the things I see, you know, as I talk to people, I talk to people about my faith, I talk to people about the truth of Christ, one of the things is, it's a common answer or thought is, well, yeah, you know, Mike could look around and he could say, well, yeah, I've sinned, he's sinned, we've all sinned, so what? Right? But this guy's looking and said, no, I've, I'm, he's embracing it. I, I have a sin problem. I've done wrong. I've done wrong. I'm in trouble before God. All right? So then he says, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. So he comes. So the first thing is, second one though, is recognition of my sin is the next step. Coming to a reverence or a fear of God, recognition of my own sin. Thirdly, he, he says this, but he has done nothing wrong. This man has done nothing wrong. Now, I'm not sure how this guy would know that. I'm not sure if he was just kind of making a statement that he doesn't deserve to be on the cross. Ultimately, I believe he was, he was making a very true statement. Christ had never sinned. This man has done nothing wrong. So he's recognizing something unique about Jesus, right? Like if I would look and say, man, you know, Jared Barnes is such a good testimony. That guy has never done anything wrong. And you guys would be like, mm, <laughs> probably not true. No? <laughs> I mean, you'd agree he did a great job. But you'd also say, he hasn't arrived at perfection, right? Okay, so, this, so, he, so he's looking, he says, this man has done nothing wrong. And then he says, and he said to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he looks to Jesus, and he says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Okay, so try to think, um, I don't know, who's your, who's your coach right now? Coach Beals, right? Okay, so let's just take... <laughs> Twitter and uh, uh, Facebook and, and cell phones out of the picture, you're going to leave Ohio State, you know. So the season's over, you know, you're going to graduate, you're, you're moving out of town, you're not going to see Coach Beals, the baseball coach. And so you're getting ready to leave, and, and, and you say to Coach Beals, Coach Beals, remember me when you come in your kingdom. You think you'd probably say that to him? <laughs> what do you think? Who would you say that to? Remember me when you come to establish your kingdom. Who would you say that to? I, really, to God. You know, I mean, you, there's all sorts of people. They, you know, they, they got power and they got things going on. And, <clears throat> but you don't say things like, remember me when you come in your kingdom. So he's recognizing not only is Jesus in his humanity, in his, in his, 
character perfect, but he's not just a man. He's going to establish a kingdom that, he, that he's God above. And look what he says to him. He says, remember me when you come in your kingdom. All right, so the third one is recognition of Jesus for who he is. You need to come to a recognition of Jesus for who he is. But when he says, remember me, we need to have a response to Jesus. We need to say yes to Jesus. Now notice, okay, try to, try to picture, okay, so, so here's Jesus, right? And I'm this guy on the cross that's believing the things, and here's the other guy over here. Remember, and, I, and what did I do, you know? He's making fun of Jesus, and I'm starting, I'm like, man, don't you fear God? But now I'm interaction, interacting with Jesus. And now I say, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Why doesn't he say, hey, remember me and that guy when you come in your kingdom? What do you think? Any thoughts on that one? Why does it say, remember me and him? Doesn't he care about him? Yeah. See, here's what I say, you know, when it, when it really comes down to it, as, as we go through this process, we develop a fear of God, we recognize our sin, we believe that Christ is who he claimed to be. But you know what? The only person that can respond to Jesus for me is me. Right? Like, I can't say, hey, Jesus, make sure that uh, Mike becomes a Christian. I can pray for Mike, but Mike eventually needs to respond to Jesus. Does that make sense? You know, and, and, but, but on this thing, just, just a, a final thought here. On this thing about being concerned about other people, one of the things I think you could ask in people in your lives, people that you know on your team, maybe somebody in your family, maybe friends from back home, maybe a roommate. Let's say you've come to the point where you have placed your faith and trust in Christ. Sometimes you might want to ask, okay, where, where's this person in this process? Are they in the point where they don't even think about God and they don't seem to have any reverence for God? Well, maybe that's where you start talking, right? Or you say, oh, yeah, I'm, I definitely believe in God, you know? But it's like, well, do you realize that you're kind of in trouble with God? You know? And again, it's not to say, you're in trouble because you're such a bad person. You need to be like me. No, you don't need to be like me. You need to believe in Jesus. You know, you need to trust in him. That's what it's about. Well, you know, is it a person they need to recognize who Christ really is? Or maybe they've grown up and they hear this and they hear this, but you know what? They've never pulled the trigger. They've never said yes to Christ. And they need to respond to that. And I think it's, it's things that we can think. We can look at that process. So kind of wrapping it up, what I would say is, you know, you're going to come upon things if you're reading the scripture that look like contradictions. And I would, I would argue, ultimately, they're all solvable. Now, you could come to me next week and hit me with one that, you know what, I might not be able to solve. I might not have that answer yet. You know, and to be honest, I would argue nobody in this room will have every answer before you die, before you leave this earth. And so the, the issue is, it, it's not to avoid when you see them in scripture, you want to try to come to a solution. But if somebody comes back to me, I was, I was talking about Michael, a few, Michael Ben, a few years ago. Let's say he hits me with a question, I just don't have a good answer. You know, like I'm not going to check out of my faith based on that. I've, I've had enough answers, I'm far enough along, I want to keep looking for that answer. I want to come to some solutions, I want to help him, I want... But, but don't get rocked when you get one that you don't have the answer to. But neither keep on avoiding them and storing them up so that then you're like, eh, I don't know if I really want to read my Bible. I don't think it's, it's got too many contradictions, you know. All right, let me pray for you. Lord Jesus, thanks for these men and women, and I pray for each of us as, we, as we're in this uh, Easter weekend and, and Good Friday and the remembrance that you paid the absolute, perfect, overwhelming sacrifice and payment for our sins. That we can have our sin completely eradicated, completely taken away. 
by simply trusting in you, by responding to you, by saying, Jesus, remember me. Please be my Savior. I pray that we would, we would rejoice in that. We would rejoice in the reality of the resurrection. Lord, we rejoice in the reality that your word is true and that we'd see that people around us need to know about you. They need to know or they need to have a reverence of fear of you. They need to recognize their shortcomings. They need to recognize, Jesus, that you are who you claim to be. And they need to respond to you in your name. Amen. Yes, we don't have contact cards, so no gift card drawing tonight. Um, But one thing I've challenged you guys.